That's just a few minutes about the chain rule. Suppose we've got a function f from rm to rl and a function g from rn to rm. We want to relate the derivative of the composition to the derivative of f and the derivative of g. So just to get a sense for this, let's suppose that we start with a vector x in rn. We can feed that vector into g and we get g of x, a vector in rm. We can feed that vector into f and we get f of g of x, a vector in rl. Now that's just how the composition of functions works. What happens if we wiggle the input a little bit? That's what the derivative is measuring. So instead of putting x in, let's put in x plus a small vector h. And we plug this into g. The output is, well, it's almost g of x, but we've got to add something, namely the derivative. We have to add the derivative of g at x, because this is measuring how much wiggling the input x is going to affect the output. Now this new thing is being put into f. And the output is very close to f of g of x. But again, we've got to add something, namely the derivative. This is the derivative of f at g of x. Because before we were just inputting g of x into f, now we're inputting a wiggled version of g of x. So we measure the derivative of f near g of x. And the parameter that the derivative takes is the amount that we wiggled by. And we wiggled g of x by this, the derivative of g at x. This is the chain rule. Now let's try to do a slightly more concrete example. Instead of rm, rn, and rl, let's just suppose that f is a function from r2 to r. So it takes in two parameters, spits out a real number. And g will be a function from r to r2. It takes a single real parameter and produces a two-dimensional vector. Now the same sort of thing happens. We might start with a real number t. And we're going to plug that real number into g. g takes real numbers as input. The output of g, however, is a two-dimensional vector, and we're going to write that as g sub 1 of t, g sub 2 of t. This two-dimensional vector is the input to f, and the result is the application of f to the two-dimensional vector. It's f of the vector g1 of t, g2 of t. And now, just like before, the question is, how does wiggling the input t affect the output, which is f of g of t? We want to know what the derivative is. So again, we start with t, and we wiggle it a little bit by adding a small number h. And this gets plugged into g, and we get these two outputs, slightly wiggled versions of g1 of x and g2 of x. These then are going to be plugged into uh, the function f. And the output, well, it's some real number. And this is what we want to try to understand. How does wiggling the input affect the output? The thing that's confusing here is that wiggling the input of g affects both of the outputs of g, which will affect both of the inputs of f, which will then affect the single output of f. So to understand this sort of thing, we can apply the chain rule. So again, f is a function from r2 to r, and g is a function from r to r2. So if we're going to use a chain rule, we're going to evaluate the derivative of the composition at a point t in r. And by the chain rule, we just get that this is the derivative of f evaluated at g of t, composed with the derivative of g at t. But let's write this all out in terms of matrices just to get a real concrete sense of what's going on. What I've written down here is the derivative of f evaluated at g of t as a matrix written down with partial derivatives. And here's the derivative of g at t, which I've written down as a matrix. And composition of linear functions is matrix multiplication. So instead of writing the circle for composition, I just wrote a dot for matrix multiplication. And we will multiply out these two matrices. Now we're going to get two terms. The first term is this, the derivative of f in the x1 direction evaluated at g of t times the derivative of g1 with respect to t at the point t. Uh, plus a very similar looking term, but instead of g1 and x1, we've got g2 and x2. And the important thing to realize here is that wiggling the input of t is affecting both g1 and g2. The single input of g affects both of those outputs. Both of those outputs then go to affect both inputs of f, 
which then go to affect the output of f. And the chain rule adds together these effects, and that's where we've got these two different terms here. And the awesome thing here is that linear algebra manages these complicated relationships for us. Suppose we've got two functions again, f and g, and let's say here that the domains and the ranges are all r2. And now I wiggle the first input to g. So when I wiggle an arrow, I draw it in red. So I'm wiggling the first input of g. And I want to know how is that going to affect the first output of f, say. Well, wiggling the first input of g is going to affect the first output of g, which is going to affect the first input of f and consequently the first output of f. But wiggling the input of g also will affect the second output of g, which will also affect the first output of f. So the upshot here is that matrix multiplication is mixing together all of these input and output relationships. That's really what the chain rule is about.